Hello, everyone. Um, welcome or welcome back. Um, for those of you who did not make it to uh, the first part of this presentation or the series of presentations, I'll introduce myself again. I'm the moderator. My name is Aliyah Swaby. I'm a reporter with the investigative news outlet ProPublica, writing about children and families, specifically in the South. Over the last year and a half, I've written a lot about restrictions and access to gender affirming care for trans adults and trans children, especially in conservative states and municipalities. I'm excited to hear the second half of the panels we have today under the umbrella question, how and for whom can we do better? This panel will consist of three presentations and then about 20 minutes of questions and answers. Um, feel free to post your questions in the Q&A box and we can get to them later. Um, so I'm going to first introduce all of our panelists, and then I will hand it over to our first presenter. Uh, so we have Shay Kill McLean, who is a writer, educator, research scientist, public scholar, and thought leader studying the relationships between human biology, racism, and health inequities. Dr. McLean is an eco-evolutionary biologist, PhD, biological anthropologist, BAMA, and sociologist, BAMA, whose research highlights and confronts the unethical use of biology as an ideology and legitimating rationale to justify systemic exploitation, develops ways to study human health and biology without reproducing racism. He is a social and natural scientist and public science communicator with over 13 years of interdisciplinary research experience studying human health, evolutionary biology, sociology, history of science and medicine, science and technology studies, bioethics, and philosophies of science and biology. Dr. McLean's work advances the study of health inequities by synthesizing Darwinian evolutionary theory, theoretical population genetics, epidemiology, and Du Boisian historical sociology to develop his eco social theory of disease distribution. Next, we have Dr. Nikki Stevens, a critical technology researcher, software engineer, and community organizer. Stevens' academic research focuses on the ways that software engineering upholds systems of power, like white supremacy and transphobia, and how software developers can engage with abolitionist theory in their work. As a software engineer and technical architect, Stevens led the architecture of web properties for billion-dollar corporations like Coca-Cola, Sony, and Instagram. Their work has won numerous awards, including at South by Southwest. Stevens' work in the Drupal community earned them the Aaron Winburn Award and recognitions by Red Hat and the Linux Foundation. They sit on the select board in Bradford, Vermont, and the board of directors of the Vermont League of Cities and Towns. They are currently a postdoctoral researcher at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where they are writing a book about software engineering and the contemporary prison abolition movement. And last but not least, we have Isabel Goldsman. Dr. Goldman holds an MD from Temple University. She spent much of her career as a consultant analyzing clinical trials, regulatory submissions, and prescription drug and device marketing. After helping launch and shape Cell Reports Medicine, she joined Cell as a leading edge editor while also becoming Cell Press's second inclusion and diversity officer. Isabel led the establishment of Cell Press's guidelines on reporting sex and gender-based analyses. She chairs Elsevier's Gender Equity Task Force Workstream, focused on sex and gender reporting and research, and has spoken on improving the language of sex and gender in science. Finally, Isabel believes that words matter. Uh, precise, accurate, and inclusive language is essential, and biomedical journals must front and center issues of equity in research, science, health, and medicine, while also ensuring that the science they help publish is not misused for exclusionary agendas. She enjoys working with authors on pieces that explore that nexus where social forces collide with science, medicine, and public health. Um, welcome to all of our panelists. And we will start um, the presentations with Dr. McLean. This presentation is titled Challenges and Opportunities for Clear Communication about Sex, Gender, and Genomics. Hello, everyone. And of course, thanks for attending. So today, as stated, and uh, thank you, Aaliyah, for the, the introduction. My focus for my conversation is on challenges and opportunities for clear communication related to sex, gender, and genomics. So a quick overview, what I'm really doing today 
is restating the topic as a question and using this as a sense of a, an exercise, an intellectual exercise for us to take things into consideration with respect to the fact that in most cases, when we ask questions, we don't necessarily get the answer just because we've asked the question and we seek out to end, we seek the answer. In a lot of cases, the answer is likely just asking a better question, figuring out how you can do that in order to bring yourself closer to understanding what reality is and, uh, and also how relationships or processes work. So in that sense, what I tried to do was break down understanding what then the topic or question would be and then the subsequent questions that come with it. So thinking about the challenges uh, and then the opportunities and then within the context of the challenges and opportunities for clear communication with respect to genomics and sex categorization and gender, we have to also ask, what is the risk? Mind you, given that context of risk, there are two risks we can take into consideration, the epistemic risk and the ethical risk. Epistemic risk regarding just being wrong about the fact, which happens on a consistent basis, with <laughs> regarding these topics that we're discussing, there's that issue, but then there's also the ethical risk. And this is about the risk of causing harm. So taking these things into consideration are important. And uh, the quote that I provide here is from uh, Clark Barrett with regards to if the acceptance of a particular explanation for an observed pattern of behavior entails real world consequences that would lead to harm, then epistemic risk entails ethical risk. So these things are directly related. And then of course, which is an element of the question of what are the risks, we also have to look at, uh, look at the reflection of that. What are our responsibilities? So regarding the challenges, it is quite clear for me more than anything else, there's an issue with definitions. There's a definitional dilemma. The definitional dilemma is directly connected to an issue, it's an issue of power, right? And that issue of power is also connected to the fact that biology is used unethically as an ideological tool for legitimate or and as a legitimating rationale to justify inequality and exploitation. It's generally been utilized as a post hoc justification for that per, for the purpose of justifying different protocols or, or colonial mandates and et cetera, and standards that we come to take for granted today as quote unquote normal. So with regards to understanding the challenges, we have to understand how we got here in the first place. Where I would like to start is just giving a, a quick little framework for the historical grounds of social construction of racism. And I will explain how that is directly related to all of this quite late after we go through the timeline. So a lot of the times people generally like to start these uh, frameworks on understanding race and racism with saying, well, it starts with 1492. People love that number to some relative extent on one end, and then there's the obsession with the 1619. And I start a little bit earlier with the historical analysis. We're looking at the estimated beginning of the transoceanic slave trade. And the significance of this timeline is helping demonstrate that race, racism is socially constructed. Social constructions, something that's socially constructed can only happen slowly through events, through actions. People have to do work in order to make sure that things are done in the first place to socially construct these rules. So in this timeline, we, there's a, a series of, of events that we see central elements to the social constructions of race, especially with regards to the US, settler America. And paying close attention to this, this framework, I want everybody to note and keep this in mind, 1662, the passage of Partis Sequitur Ventrum, that is a Roman law uh, that, that was passed in the Virginian colony that can, can basically com was composed of uh, the chattel principle. The passage of the status of slavery, of chattel slavery from the mother to the child through maternal inheritance. Another important component, 1795, we see German, uh, German, uh, German anatomist Johann Frederick Blumenbach creates the Caucasian racial category 
I'm the, these things are significant for a number of different reasons, which I uh, that I'm going to demonstrate. So connecting, thinking about those categories, right? How we can have these different fight, like this contemporarily in the United States, there's the general framework for uh, we generally use um, Bloom and Box categories, but Bloom and Box work is extending from Carl von Linn, also known as Carlos Linnaeus, was a Swedish nat naturalist and botanist, though responsible for publishing Systema Naturae, what we are all quite in, in science quite familiar with. Uh, the first edition published in 1735, where he introduced his broad taxonomic system for classifying living organisms. Linnaeus had an interesting framework in a sense to where this was based on his idea. His imagine he imagined that plants had vaginas and penis and, and penises, and they reproduced on marriage beds. I don't know how they was getting married. I don't know which plant was the priest, but this is what he said. <laughs> this is his understanding that he took. His classification system is extremely coarse, highly artificial, and it focuses purely on the morphological features of reproductive organs. It doesn't capture fundamental sexual, but the actual functions. So that's something that's missing from this system that we are, binomial system we are still using today, binomial nomenclature system that we still use. And in that first edition, he also provides a list of varieties of uh, Homo sapiens sapiens, dividing Homo sapiens sapiens into four regional taxa. And he was one of the first to do this, but he does not provide any details or descriptions for the four varieties in the first edition. It wasn't until the 10th edition that we see drastic changes. The significance of the 10th, the 10th edition of Systems of Nature is the fact that, well, now these varieties that he's described have details. They have descriptive details. Americanus, reddish, choleric, erect, goes through and describes the hair, black, straight, thick, nostrils, beard, these things are really, really important for us to take into consideration with regards to how he's describing the phenotypes and organizing them. And then these different practices re re regulated by customs. Europaeus, Asiaticus, Afer. The importance of these, note the pattern. There's only one out of this group that you see gender or sex pop up immediately like, with regards to the, its presence in the description. And that's for Africans. Afur, black, phlegmatic, relaxed, hair is black and frizzled, skin is silky, nose flat, lips tumid. Women without shame, meme lact, lactate profusely, crafty, indolent, negligent, anoints himself with grease, governed by caprice. Only one of these these racialized groups includes women. Also in the 10th edition of System of Naturae, uh, Linnaeus includes his uh, key to the sexual system. These things are not coincidences. So a lot of the things that we discuss, especially uh, with respect to the actual formation of racism and the formation, like how we get into quote unquote, contemporary time modernity, the rise of modernity, we generally don't describe it as these things happening together with regards to the fact that the foundation of our understanding of quote unquote race and, race and racialization and even racializing other human beings, the foundation of that is first sex, specifically patriarchal sex, your colonial patriarchal sex, binary sex and gender. These things are directly connected. So, I mentioned earlier, part of secretive ventrum, and it's important for us to take that, uh, take, keep that in mind because this is part of the elements of what uh, Sita Balani referred to as the techniques to manage the broad domain of social reproduction. So and there's a reason why these techniques, th this broad domain is extremely difficult to distinguish from the quote unquote management of races because you can't distinguish them. The point and purpose of racial hygiene in regulation, how do you actually practice race, like management of population through racial hygiene? How did Eurocolonial societies do that? It was through the control and management, especially of sex, domestic life, 
family units, structuring how people interact with the, one another within their communities, as well as like with regards to understanding, regulating sex, understanding the sex and sexuality and gender in the home in regards to children. And these things are directly connected to your colonialism and racism, even though we see them commonly separated at this, they're very, very distinct phenomena uh, when they're connected to one another. And that's one of the things that's also interesting to note. Without binary sex, it becomes far more difficult to quote unquote racialize. Colonial frameworks are based on these different, cat like, different categorical systems that rank different groups and set it up to where you have to understand, well, who am I allowed to abuse and exploit? Who am I not allowed to abuse and exploit? Set, binary sex is a required framework for maintaining that system. And this is one of the things for us to pay close attention to and goes back to the fact that racism is a colonial breeding program. And it, in that sense, I mean that in the most literal sense. I'm not just, it's not a, a metaphor. I literally mean that. It's a breeding program framed on a series of different logics all the way down to the understanding of sex, not just race. And these things are important for us to take into consideration because these forms of regulation and arrangement of and grouping of peoples, it, not only have we been taught to do that, socialized and taught to do that and are still doing it today, it's still very much influencing how we go about understanding human health, how we go about understanding who fits in what group, and also understanding who is the people in society who is likely to be deemed a threat as a result of not fitting into some of these frameworks and category and binary categories. So a lot of this, this has to do with the fact that the colonial encounter relies on a particular set of logics with regards to creating difference a particular set of differences in the first place. Uh, what uh, Bolani also referred to is that, like, uh, a form of a taxonomy specifically, a single science of order that gave exploitate this exploitation, colonial exploitation, the weight of philosophy. These are the things that are important for us to note because it's telling us about a relationship. A lot of times people are under the impression that, for example, the thing they should be afraid of is biology. For example, they refer to the biologicalization of race or the biologicalization of gender. No, it's not biologicalization. Biology didn't do anything. Biology was recruited to do the work of your colonialism. It, biology didn't recruit race. It was recruited <laughs> by colonialism. So racism is what recruited biology. So we have to take that into consideration. So it helps us understand that these, these different fields of science and investigation are being utilized for particular types of political purposes to achieve different means. So it's important for us to take this in consideration so that we don't get distracted with regards to the actual issue being an issue of power. It's not a matter of difference. So with regards to that being a matter of power and not difference, right? Not simply quote unquote phenotypic difference. We need to understand what patriarchy is. Patriarchy is, is a social system that is basically referred to as uh, referred to as a functioning as a rule of father, like rule of or by fathers is really, really important for us to understand that this is not something that is simply uh, quote unquote the natural way that humans organize themselves. Patriarchy is a sociocultural system. For the, one of the main central elements of patriarchy that is required for it to be able to function is this a particular kind of cultural assertion that valorizes the idea that, that men, not just men, but fathers ought to rule over mothers and children, that their claims supersede mothers and children, as well as the weak. These things are really important for us to understand in the sense to where it becomes clear that th this is about different social positions, which also helps us hi uh, helps highlight a little bit more about what's going on in regards to the history, uh, the, uh, the actual history of gender prior to Euro colonialism, to the rise of Euro colonialism in, uh, in quote unquote modernity. So 
one of the things that I also find very, very helpful, an excellent um, reference and text to understanding patriarchy, Bell Hooks' uh, piece, Understanding Patriarchy, written in 20, uh, 2010, where she does a really, really great job at kind of noticing that the intersecting systems and matrix of domination, patriarchy is a primary social system, and the norms of patriarchy are the are central to being taught in the home. They treat the, these are the things that are, that are taught to children first, and then other logics are taught. The foundation is first patriarchy. So when it comes to a matter of difference, it's important for us to also understand the fact that the claim that we are dealing with problems that are generated as the result of some foundational wound, like the idea that sexual difference and dimorphism is a foundational wound that humans just can't get over. And that is where we see inequality arise. That's where we see differences with regards to gender and sex and sexual. That's not what that is. That's a post hoc justification. They did that after they said that after they did a bunch of stuff for hundreds of years. It's important for us to really, really make sure that we we take the claims that are made and put them in the context of material reality. So in that sense, it, 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 one of the things that I wanted to, I did with this slide is pull out some helpful quotes from uh, Thomas LeCur and also um, Sylvia Federici. So the Galenic, uh, the Galenic model of hierarchically ordered sexes would have predicted differences in the quality of the, two, of the two sexes, but patriarchy itself was predicated on the fact that when by the labor and chafing of the testicles or stones, blood is turned into sperm and the man's would be hot, white, and thick, while the woman's would be thinner, colder, and feebler. The, the, the complete, these, these different logics that were structured were structured for the purposes of ensuring that particular people were in power more than anything else. This becomes even more clear when looking at what LaCour notes regarding civilization. So civilization, like a conquering people, subjects others to its exploitation, and it prescribes manifestations of sexual life in children. It makes heterosexual genital, genital love the only permitted sort. And in doing so, takes the infant and an animal organism with, with, like others, an unmistakably bisexual disposition and molds it into either a man or a woman. And here we see the power of culture thus represents itself in bodies, forges them on, as on an anvil into the required shape. And this is something that also it becomes extremely clear when just thinking about example intersex people and the practices that have been utilized for a ridiculously long time and even only until more recently have some medical institutions in the United States completely stopped quote unquote doing the corrective quote unquote corrective surgery so the, it becomes clear if the, the the quote unquote things that are not normal must be regulated as uh, aberrations and extremely uh, extremely dangerous uh, dispositions that will technically classified as disabilities in some case. And one of the things that that Federici does an excellent job with pointing out is that sexual hierarchies are always in service of a project of domination. Next slide. So when we think about where binary gender and sex came from, we know we know and know. It, it comes from Eurocolonialism. This idea that men and women are these natural, unequivocally, unequivocal, naturally defined categories, they have distinct differences and behavioral propensities, that arose in the 18th century. It was formulated over time during the 16th and 17th century. 16th, 17th centuries. And these are so these things are far more recent. We keep actually we keep discussing them as if they're natural it's always been like this it's always it's always been this way this is more recent now that's not the case and the idea that the gender is based on sex doesn't make logical historical sense either and that's one of the things that actually makes it far more difficult for us to understand what's going on with respect to hu actual human variation because when we get a chance to look at to look at human biology, what we end up finding is something that does not match two at all. We find 20, we, we've observed at least 24 sexes 
sex karyotypes in humans. One of them terminates neonatally. <laughs> and that's one of the things that I think is interesting with respect to the fact that sex chromosomal aneuploidies happen in approximately one in 400 live human births. That's a lot more common than we are admitting to. This variation is also a central component and part of human biology. Variation is the stuff of evolution. Without, vari without variation, a species will go extinct. So there are different elements of this that we're completely missing and misunderstanding because the thing that we actually quote unquote seem to be fixed on more than anything else is what? Is the political propaganda, not the biology. That's actually what's been driving a lot of people's understandings. When we see the more, like when we look at these, uh, these patterns, we start to see that maybe the, the language should be changing. For example, instead of saying, quote unquote, a lot of times they use the language of typical male or normal male or typical female, normal female. When let's just say more co most common, because there are, we, so there's different elements. Well, yes, we have to be careful with our language that's required, but also we have to be mindful of the danger that can, the dangers and the, that can come with utilizing othering language that has drastic, drastic consequences with respect to, we didn't engage with understanding the history of how those dynamics work and who's vulnerable given the language that we use. When we get a chance, when we look at beyond just the most common, uh, quote unquote, most common sex uh, karyotypic variation that we see, we get to the quote unquote rare sex karyotype variation, it starts to get far more complicated in the sense to where it becomes clear that the idea that there are only just the XX and the XY really doesn't make any sense. Not to mention the fact that yes, there's elements of where some interest, a number of different intersex positions, uh, like uh, intersex, intersex uh, con quote unquote conditions have like are like more likely to have issues regarding infertility. You could also be a quote unquote normal or a quote common male or female and still have issues with, with infertility. It's, it, it's just a component in the fact of life, but we're not understanding it as that. So what's happening to the approaches that we're then utilizing to quote unquote provide medical treatment for addressing any of this? There's so much that we're getting completely incorrect because what is actually being focused on more than anything else is not, is, is not biology, it's the political propaganda. When looking at extremely rare sex karyotypic variation in humans, we get, so there's seven. And in one of them, I'm looking for the specific one that I saw. Which one? I think it was. I think it's the number twenty one, the triple Y syndrome, the X Y Y Y syndrome case. Uh, the less than ten cases reported, and the, one of the most recent ones that occurred. I think that that case was observed in like twenty twenty one. Was this twenty two number twenty two mosaic X Y Y Y variant? That person, this mosaicism, you see 46XY, 47XYY, 48XYYY. That person, that, um, that human had, mm, I think was, it was three, three penises. So we are seeing the karyotypic variation. And in that case, that, that case that we, that, that person was recently born, we're having three penises. We also see the particular express, phenotypic expression of their gonadal systems. Only, and, and then we also have to look at the comparison of the other systems internally, not just external genitalia. So there's, the, and mind you, a lot of these, a lot of these frameworks that are being utilized to classify people into different sexes are reliant upon a, diff, a, very, a various or a number of different assumptions with regards to the relationship between sex and gender. And they, in, in that sense, these things are interconnected. Yes, but not necessarily determining, over-determining of one another. So 
here what I did provide some definitions and in context also for the, the categorizations for each one of them and understanding the relationship to one another. So sex criteria includes genitalia at birth or chromosomal typing before birth. And this is just something to just to think about and to take into consideration. If we think about um, different genomic and genetic testing that's commonly done in medicine, we'll find that different practices that are constant, the different practices that are basically utilized with regards to letting people know what these are, the, this is the genomic profile of your of future or quote unquote future child. Like, the, like the, these are the conditions and stuff, things we've been looking for. We want to be careful about this. We're providing any form of genetic counseling. A number of intersex conditions that are reported, people generally terminate. There's like a high percentage of termination, there's a high termination rate for the, um, for those pregnancies. And a lot of it has to do with the narratives that we're utilizing and being utilized not just in society and in biology, but also in medicine. And that's, is you, that's being structured to inform the decisions that are then made about not just whether or not they're going to carry the child, but also that affects the people who are intersex and like are here, they still deserve good quality of life and services. So the orientation of framing it as an, a classification of a disease or aberrance is not helpful for humans when the variation quote unquote, is a natural reflection of life. Let's see, next slide. And this is one of the things too for us to take into consideration with how sex categorization works as because it's a political phenomenon more than anything else. The idea that we can just pure, say that these things are just purely, oh, the gender is the social thing and then sex is the biology. The fact that sex is a classification that is based on sex criteria, those sex criteria are socially determined that makes sex also social. These things can't be, like, it's not as easy as we would like to uh, believe it is, as Eurocolonialism would like us to believe it is. And the, the hierarchical frameworks that are utilized, most importantly, needs to be emphasized that it's not just simply hierarchical, it's patriarchal because we need to understand the direction and the orientation of those relationships, right? And the relationship then be between sex and gender and sex category and gender, right? So this idea that you that we are undeniably this one sex and this one gender, those things are not only just extremely very, very recent, they're not accurate depictions of what biology is, nor gender. So that means that we are at the point to where we need to then look at what our opportunities would be with respect to moving forward and figuring out, well, what is the real material reality and then how could we account for it? So one of the things that I put in this when framing the, the sense of the opportunities is a James Baldwin quote, to accept one's past, one's history, it's not the same thing as drowning in it. It is learning how to use it. An invented past can never be used. It cracks and crumbles under the pressures of life like clay in a season of drought. Very much like an invented past, the invented binaries <laughs> are crumbling. They don't match reality. So this is an opportunity for us to then do what? Apply our the evolutionary understandings. And moving forward, utilizing those as a, that as the groundwork for how we can address the problems within our contemporary practices and standards and strategies so that we can actually address the issues that have been created by the challenges themselves. All right. So in doing that, it provides us a, an opportunity to ask different types of questions, because in a lot of cases, because we've been fed these Eurocolonial ideologies, we're utilizing, we're utilizing our data, the, what we do see and some of the things that we do get right, we're using it incorrectly, asking the wrong questions. We don't understand the actual nature of the relationships between different phenomena and it's making it more difficult for us to understand the biology. And this is something I, that is very well articulated by uh, Richard Lewontin with regards to the, 
to um, his general understanding of the questions that are being asked in the fields of evolutionary biology. Right, ask the, the, I have a growing suspicion that in revealing the great variety of gen genic forms segregating into populations, we have given the right answer to the wrong question. And this is quite similar in the same sense. We have been giving the right answers in some cases to the wrong questions. So we keep trying to hyper-focus on particular types of things that we can then utilize for political purposes. And that's misdirecting our, our understanding. Evolutionary genetics as a field really provides us with a, an opportunity to understand the relationships between different phenomena and ask different types of questions with respect to uh, the, the history, the life history of organisms. So evolutionary genetics is founded on the principle that the genetic record of life is contained in genomes of living species. And it reveals evolutionary processes and relationships all the way back to universal common ancestor of all species. Those relationships are not understood in any way with the way that we contemporarily, quote unquote, understand uh, and discuss and engage with studying human genetics. In a lot of cases, gen humans are separated from all other living beings, and, and that has consequences, a crap ton of consequences that we are currently still enduring and dealing with and facing with right now, seeing the fact that, well, it's the summer and a good chunk of the planet's on fire and there are droughts in a number of different places that like, people don't have the resources they need. We see how those effect, those consequences are also differentially distributed. And that pattern fits in the, Euro, the pattern of your colonialism as well. And in this sense of understanding mapping sequence, like sequencing and analyzing uh, genomes and the st studying genetics, we really, really, really have to make sure that we are contextualizing our understandings in history, you can't do that without history. Genetics cannot be understood outside of history. It's a historical science. And that's important for us to take into consideration. Okay, let me see. Next slide. So one of the things too that I think is important for us to take into consideration in understanding evolutionary theory, a lot of the times people hyper-focus on uh, natural selection because they're like, oh, that was really the crux of Darwin's theory. It wasn't, it, it, and because technically it's possible that natural selection isn't completely responsible for everything. It is one evolutionary force. There are other evolutionary forces. And this is one of the things that uh, Lawan talks about still in uh, genetic basis of evolutionary change. The essential na nature of Darwinian revolution was the replacement of a, a metaphysical view of variation among organisms by a materialistic view. And evolution is a conversion of variation among individuals within an interbreeding group into variation between groups in space and time. Darwin's work was calling attention to the actual variation among actual organisms as the most essential and illuminating fact of nature. So rather than regarding variation among members of the same species as just a distraction, he made that the focus and the cornerstone of his theory the, making variation the cornerstone of the understanding is also a direct contradiction to the ways that difference and variation has been weaponized politically in a number of different human social and cult, social cultural systems. So it's important for us to take that into consideration. The ways that we generally understand diversity and variation have been have been really heavily saturated with poli Eurocolonial political propaganda. And it has consequences with respect to how we do our scientific work. Um, sorry to talk, sorry to interrupt no. you, Dr. McLean. Um, I was wondering. I mean, we'll have lots of time at the end for reader questions. No. This is the last slide. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Got it. One of the things that I think is important for us to really always focus on something that I've done consistently, just given my training, the basic definitions. What is actually evolution? the change in allo frequencies over time. We have to actually engage in the basic understandings first <laughs> in the, with the context of human history and, and, and as well as the context of human ethics. So this provides us a framework for understanding not just the, the history of living organisms on earth in a grander scale and sense, 
but also our relationships to one another and other living beings around us, rather than or tr for trying to orient our understandings of everything through a particular set of hegemonic political interests. <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. McLean. Um, it was it was really great to hear that. Um, and uh, I think we're going to go next to Dr. Nikki Stevens. Um, their presentation is called "Trans Data Storage: Sex and Gender in Big Data Contexts." Um, great. Uh, can you see my slides? Okay. Can you hear me? I'll take that as a yes. Um, thank you everyone for your time and your attention, um, and thanks to everyone for the labor that went into making this happen. Um, my name is Nikki Stevens, I'm a postdoc at MIT, um, and like you heard in my intro before uh, being here, I was a software engineer, um, and so my work sits at the intersection of software engineering, critical data studies, um, gender theory, critical infrastructure studies, um, and so today I'm going to be talking to you about what I think, um, what I'm thinking at the intersection of those things. Um, but before we begin, I mentioned to a colleague that I was going to be here today uh, giving a talk. And um, this friend is a senior director at one of the largest health centers in New England. Um, and he sent me this text message, uh, which reads, be sure to tell them all that electronic medical records used by community health centers are garbage and terrible for trans people. And it actually creates harm you know, if there's an icebreaker. So uh, this is my icebreaker, uh, grounding me, grounding us in the reality that uh, the ways that we think about data, construct data, use data, um, harm trans, intersex, gender queer, gender variant people on a daily basis. Um, and I know that a, a thinking mistake that I made early in my career and even early in my scholarly trajectory was thinking about data separate from um, these contexts, infrastructural, technical, contextual, and material concerns. And so um, I'm gonna spend a couple of minutes talking through the issues of trans data storage from these perspectives. Um, again, grounded in the reality um, that real people are living with the choices that we make on a daily basis. So when I talk about infrastructure, I'm drawing on um, Jeff Bowker here, and he describes infrastructure as a set of pervasive enabling resources. So computational infrastructure, databases, data storage, um, are these sets of pervasive enabling resources. And um, I think a lot of times we don't think about this infrastructure until it breaks. Um, and this is really important that the infrastructure that runs our lives is very frequently pretty invisible to us, invisible to me, right? Until the plumbing stops working, until there's a pothole, until the power goes out or the internet is down. And the infrastructure, and this includes computational infrastructure, um, is fundamentally relational. So um, what, the inf what infrastructure does for us, including computing infrastructure, is it facilitates the delivery of resources right between entities, between human beings. Here, this um, image of a train delivering what I think is coal. Um, and infrastructure is inherently ideological. And so the choices that we make to construct infrastructure, uh, right, are we running a pipeline through this place or through this place? What neighborhood are we compromising to build a freeway? All of those are, among other things, also choice-based ideologies that manifest in our built world. And so when we think about computation um, and, and databases and computational infrastructure, um, it's really crucial that we're thinking about these as relational, ideo ideological, and um, controllable by us, the people who are designing it. And so thinking about that, that text message that I received, right, and the ways that electronic medical records harm folks, one of the ways that I uh, think about marginalization, we often hear about how trans folks are marginalized in society, um, that marginalization is exclusion from infrastructure, exclusion by choice, from the, um, the tools and the systems that deliver resources to us. And so all of these uh, really rich and important scientific or expert decisions about sex and gender um, result in the creation of infrastructure. 
and that infrastructure frequently regularly marginalizes trans and intersex people, gender queer, gender diverse, gender diverse people. Um, so technically then, what does that look like? So we're gonna do a technical deep dive um, in the next two sections and then pull back up. Um, so real quick, just to make sure that we're all coming along together, um, what I'm gonna be talking to you today about are uh, databases, um, which I'm just uh, defining as an intentional collection of things. I don't know how of uh, any of the databases that you might have, folks listening, how they what they look like. Um, so I'm drawing on Lev Manovich's early definition of databases. And then um, data modeling is this moment that sits in the process of making a database before the database exists. This is us choosing how are we going to design it? What's the stuff that goes into it? You know, and data modeling is this moment where we're looking out at the world and saying, what is it that we need to capture and how? Um, and it's, again, a very choice based moment. There is no natural way. Uh, to store any single thing in a database or to convert it into data. Um, uh, and here's uh, when I, you know, when I'm talking about databases with you today, here's a, a picture of a database. And I'm just going to talk about um, things at a smaller scale, even though I know many folks are working with larger databases. Um, so there is a technique in data modeling and in database design called reification. And reification is um, comes from linguistics. And it's this act of um, essentially making a verb a noun. So to reserve a hotel room becomes a reservation entry. To marry becomes this um, entity called a marriage. Uh, I can't see any of you. Usually I'm, I'm used to seeing people's heads nods at this point. So in practice, if we continue that marriage example, reification might look like, oh, thank you for the little thumbs up reacts. Uh, in practice, reification might look like here's a person table um, or a person entity, and maybe that person is uniquely identified by their social security number if we're here in the United States. Um, if we wanted to store who that person was married to, we might add another field to that table um, for spouse. Um, but we haven't reified yet, right? This is sort of a clunky way uh, to store this. So typically, marriage is stored in this way, where there is a new entity, a new table appears called marriage, and it has its own unique ID number. And there we store the social security number of each spouse. Um, but one of the things that reification does for us is it enables us to sort of gather more information, to capture more knowledge about this thing that we have reified, this thing that we think is so important, right? That we've promoted it to a first class citizen in our database. So we still have this person table on my right and then on my left. Um, this marriage table, where now I'm storing not only those two um, links to those two individuals, but also other information, maybe the date, the officiant, the witness, whatever a particular municipality might require. Um, so this act of reification then is a really um, ideologically powerful one, right? It, it is signaling that that for us, this institution of marriage is so important that we want to make a separate table and we want to store a bunch of stuff about it. Um, and I think, again, here, Jeff Bowker uh, has written a bunch um, about how the database itself is not just a storage of data, right? But it is this um, infrastructure that interacts with the world and shapes the world in its own image, right? It is a performative object. So when we've got data um, shaped in this way around marriage, it reminds us every time we look at it that this is what marriages look like. Um, however, uh, there is this very common problem called the fallacy of reification, which is the tendency to assume that the categories of thought, the way that we're thinking about things, might coincide with this character of the empirical world. And so to continue with this marriage example, Somerville, Massachusetts recently um, <clears throat> passed an ordinance protecting polyamorous families. And uh, what this ordinance does is acknowledge that people have found themselves in arrangements that don't look like traditional or common two-person arrangements. Um, and so what we have done by storing marriage in this way, right, is, is committed the fallacy of reification. And what we can do instead, we can make a different ideological and infrastructural choice and choose to store marriage in, for example, this way. Um, and this design enables us to have as many people as needed, right? We've added that third table, 
as many people as needed can enter this relationship object, we can still store a bunch of other um, information about it. And a thing that uh, for me is really important when I when I walk through this example with people is that you don't have to like it. You don't have to want it for yourself. You don't have to believe it is ethical or good according to your faith system. But what you do need to do is recognize that this arrangement exists in the empirical world, right? It exists so much that municipalities are officially recognizing these arrangements. Um, we might call this uh, the dignity of belief. Um, so we are granting folks the dignity of being recognized and treated as uh, uh, people living lives worthy of receiving infrastructure, right? Worthy of receiving the pervasive enab enabling resources of computational infrastructure. And so we can extend this to sex and gender. Um, so let's look at what that reification might look like in a textual, in a technical context. So uh, normally, <clears throat> excuse me, when we're storing, uh, uh, most commonly, let's say, when we're storing sex and gender, often we have one user table and it's just got a user ID, a sex field, a gender field, maybe if we're lucky, a pronoun field. Uh, but when we reify gender, right, we promote it to this first class citizen, we give it its own table. And now here we can have a user table and we can have a gender table. And that gender table might have its own gender ID, you know, some, some unique identifier, um, a text description named gender, and maybe some pronouns. Um, but it is uh, often, um, we often talk about in trans or gender theory, that one's gender um, is contextual. And I even saw um, a question about this in the Q&A, right? The, the person asking the question was like, well, I know my gender is, I know, I know my personal one. And the, the question asked her, um, my gender depends, um, varies based on context. How do I store that for my participants? How do I store that for myself? So one way to do that would be to add this context field to the gender table. Um, another way to do that is to also reify the context itself, right? There is no limit to the number of things that we can treat as um, first class citizens in our data model and as things um, for which we want to collect more information, right? The fields we make control the data we collect, controls the information we see, controls how we think about things in the world, right? This is the performative aspect of these databases. So in a, in a complete model, complete enough, uh, I think for our purposes here, we would um, perhaps store gender this way, where we've got a user table, we have a gender table, which links the gender to the user, we have a gender context table, which tells me that in a particular context, this is the gender. We have more information about the context and we have more information about their pronouns. Um, and so as an example of this, um, the person who sent me the text message with which I opened this talk has often talked about how <clears throat> in health centers that he's worked at, you might have someone come in for testing uh, as, their, as their true self with their, their transgender, their name, their pronouns. Um, but if you want to call that person at home, you might need to use a different gender, a different name, a different set of pronouns, right? Some people are safe to be out when they're at a clinic, not safe to be out when they're at home. Um, and this is a way that we can store that in a structured way and extend to them um, the infrastructure that gives them resources like safety, like testing, like high quality healthcare. Um, and so the ultimate design intervention that I'm recommending here is that you can reify sex and gender and include values from things like lookup tables, which um, if you've ever had to fill out your, your state or country on a web form, right, are these big long lists, right? We can have big long lists for things like sex, gender, pronoun, context, especially if we're working in, um, in, uh, with groups beyond North America, <clears throat> or if we're including um, indigenous communities, any sort of non-white, non-US based, uh, we cannot assume that we have fixed lists of any of these fields. Um, however, there's always a catch. Um, and so while that table um, is technically sound, it'll run, right? I could give you the SQL code uh, to recreate that table in any database that you have right now. 
Um, we have some quite significant, we being the trans and intersex community and those who care about us, um, have pretty significant problems in this moment <clears throat> from local municipalities um, and from the White House. And so, you know, we've got um, really increasing trans antagonism from many fronts. And then we have uh, scholars left like Jeff Bowker saying, well, if the database is, the database is performative, um, and so part of what I'm doing here is asking, well, what can we help the database create as we do our research, <clears throat> as we record information about trans and intersex people? Um, the problem with that question, and I appreciate Dr. McLean's um, reinforcement that we, we must attend to the questions that we're asking. One of the problems with asking what can the database help us do is that scholars for decades have argued that computing databases included have really problematic and violent epistemological foundations, right? So the logics of computing, of databases, of gathering data are based in white supremacy, are based in anti-Blackness, are informed by colonial logics. And in my discipline, you know, in, in a, a discipline like critical data studies, when you come to this point and you say, oh no, the tools I've been looking at are also based in these these systems that do violence, must we throw our tools away, um, right? What are we to do knowing these histories, but also seeing the real material harms that um, marginalization and exclusion from infrastructure causes? What are we to do? So often um, we'll hear this quote, right? The master's tools will never dismantle the master's house. Must we throw our tools away? And here I really think about um, what Ruth Wilson Gilmore tells us, and about this question more broadly, Dr. Gilmore says, we miss the apostrophe S. And so I want to close with this idea that what we must attend to is not just how we use the tools, right? Do we put, um, do we add five tables to how we're storing sex and gender? Um, may maybe, right? Probably yes. But what does the apostrophe S tell us about the, um, the ownership and control of those tools, right? So what Dr. Gilmore is saying is that we may use these tools, we may use tools like databases and computation, but only if we have access to control how they are used. And the we here, because I'm talking about trans and intersex people, the we is trans and intersex people. Um, so this is uh, Arnstein's ladder of participation. And when we talk about, um, what Dr. Gilmore is talking about is above citizen control, right? It is ownership. It is complete control and authority over how tools about us are used with us, right? So I show this and I invite you to think where are trans and intersex people on the ladder of participation in my own work, right? In the studies that I run, um, right? And the question ultimately is how are you giving us control of the infrastructure so that we are not continually marginalized by it? Um, you know, the in the title of my talk was the word big data. Um, what makes big data big are often called the three Vs. So big data is big because of the velocity of information which is coming in at a higher volume than ever before with greater variety than we've seen, right? So it's bigger, it's faster, and it's more different from each other. Um, but what is also true about big data is that it provides unprecedented visibility into trans um, and, and frankly, all marginalized communities' lives, and as a result, much greater vulnerability. So being stored in big data, right, being scooped into a data set is not necessarily um, good or helpful for the trans or intersex people in your work. And the only people who can answer that are the trans and intersex people closest to you, right? The, how are we controlling our own safety and visibility as researchers do um, important work researching sex and gender. So, so coming back, right, to this, um, the text that I opened with, right, we are, I am a part of a community who has as common knowledge understands that all data, it seems like about us is harming us. Um, and so as you can um, raise the amount of, as you can bring trans and intersex folks and communities up the ladder of participation, um, at that point, we can think about what it really means to do research with um, trans and intersex people about sex and gender. Um, and again, all of this for me is about thinking not about any of these separately, but about all of them together um, as a way to keep our communities 
uh, safer, especially as things change. And so I will stop there. Thank you very much for your time. Great. Thank you so much, Dr. Stevens, for that. Um, next, we have Dr. Goldman um, before we get to uh, Q&A. So uh, keep putting your questions in the chat um, and uh, we'll get to some of them after Dr. Goldman's talk. Um, the, her talk is called Elevating Equity in Scientific Publishing. Good afternoon, my name is Isabel Goldman and thank you for inviting me. What an amazing two days of talks this has been. I'm honored and humbled to be a part of so many luminaries. I'm going to be talking about elevating equity in scientific publishing today. And um, I am current, I have worked as a leading edit, edge editor at Cell. And Cell is a scientific journal at uh, Cell Press, which publishes about 50 journals. Like The Lancet, Cell Press is part of Elsevier, which is owned by uh, Relics. Leading Edge is the section of Cell that publishes things like commentaries, reviews, and perspectives. I am also the former DEI lead at Cell Press. When that position was created in 2020, it was created as a rotating position. Every 12 to 18 months, someone new would come in, and um, it's not a permanent position, it's not a full-time position. So I was asked to talk about how and for whom can we do better. And I rephrase this to the question, for whom, why, and how must the scientific publishing industry do better? As an editor who's worked on a lot of equity pieces, I feel like if I had a dollar for every time I've suggested a verb be changed from can, may, or might to must, I feel like I would be a rich woman. I'm going to be focusing on the scientific publishing industry, but much of what I say is really applicable to academia or any other scientific organization. I will speak from my experiences doing equity work as an editor and as a DEI lead for my company and as a woman who's had a transgender experience and as the only trans editor that I know of at Cell or Cell Press. Importantly, the opinions and views I express here are my own and they do not necessarily reflect those of Cell, Cell Press, Elsevier, or Relics, or any of their employees. So I started with talking about for whom must the scientific publishing industry do better, and I'm going to focus on sex and gender minorities. And throughout this talk, I might refer to sex and gender minorities, or trans and gender diverse people, or trans and gender nonconforming people. And regardless of what term I use, I always intend to be inclusive of intersex people. I'm aware that Many intersex people don't identify as trans, and it may just be the phrasing that I use. Um, although a lot of my talk will be focused on sex and gender minorities, really the things that I'm talking about are applicable to people from all marginalized communities. And a final, like for whom the scientific publishing industry must do better is society. Um, science doesn't exist outside of the society which it's conducted in, and therefore it's held accountable to that society within which it exists. So why must the scientific publishing industry do better, particularly for sex and gender minorities? Well, the first has to do with historic and ongoing harm. And this is a long topic of the ways that the publishing industry has historically and continues to harm sex and gender minorities, trans and gender diverse people. One of the main ways that it's harmed us is through bad science, published science that has harmed sex and gender min minorities throughout history. I would urge everyone to read Julia Serrano's amazing work on the concepts of rapid onset gender dysphoria and autogynephilia, which are thoroughly debunked concepts that somehow continue to percolate through the scientific literature. They have also harmed us from inappropriate generalization from studies in cisgender people to transgender people. And we've, we've heard during these um, conversations about science on trans people that came from inappropriate population sizes. This could be a whole talk, and so I'll just move on. The historic exclusion of sex and gender minorities and researchers and peer reviewers from science about them, and even discussions of sex and gender is another way that the publishing industry has harmed us. The persistent insistence on sex assigned at birth as the mechanistic and causal explanation for the differences observed between sex categories. This circular argument persists and goes that 
The sex categorization process itself is the causal and mechanistic explanation for the differences observed by this in the sex categories. Clinging to outmoded notions of binary, by the binary and immutability um, notions of sex and gender. When we introduced our guidelines for reporting sex and gender based analyses across thousands of Elsevier journals, I received an email from an editor who told me that he disagreed with the guidelines because the science of sex and gender was settled canon. I politely replied to him that science doesn't have canon and that the science of sex and gender evolves and changes like all other science. The publishing industry has also harmed sex and gender minorities and trans people through the language it's used, um, misusing and conflating terms like sex and gender, using terms like biological sex when they mean sex assigned at birth, the use of terms like biological female and biological male. And you can actually trace how those terms have increased usage on the internet in lockstep with anti-trans legislation. The persistent harmful belief that, for example, the estrogen, the biological effects of estrogen produced from an ovary are more biological than the biological effects of estrogen administered exogenously. This is the belief that the biologies of trans people are less biological than the biologies of cis people. The historical reticence to name change policies is another way that harm has occurred. And finally, the historic and ongoing platforming of cisgender academics to talk about sex and gender and trans people when their expertise has nothing to do with gender, sex, and trans people. This is an adherence to both sidism that has created a condition for the trans debate where beliefs like trans people don't exist or trans women aren't women have been elevated, dangerously elevated to hold a seat at the table of rational discourse. Now, another reason why the industry must do better is because rigorous science demands that it does. Increasing the diversity, inclusivity, and equity of our science leads to more accurate, precise, rigorous, in short, better science. If our quest as a publishing industry is to publish the best science possible, then we must do better. As we know, certain sociopolitical groups, and this has been talked about today, have co-opted, misappropriated, and misused the science of sex and gender to create a thin scientific veneer to support laws that harm trans people and threaten their rights and existence. Such misuse must be unacceptable to any scientific organization. If we don't stop it, this kind of misuse of science creates a framework with which exclusionary groups can move up the marginalization ladder, progressively curtailing more and more people's rights in the name of science. And this slide has done the rounds during this um, symposium, so I won't spend time on it. I do put this one up, which is the responses that anti-trans legislatures gave to the question of defined woman. And I put it up there so we can all recoil in horror. Yesterday, Paisley talked about these so-called women's bills of rights. And when I read through this, I think of um, Simone de Beauvoir writing in 1949 that one is not born a woman, but rather becomes a woman. That society tells us what a woman should do and how she should act, that gender roles are learned. It's as if these legislatures want to roll things back to say that actually no, gender roles are biologically determined in utero. And this is another horror show. Finally, the scientific publishing industry must do better because it has an ethical responsibility to do better. It has tremendous power and resources to effectuate change. And if it has the means to do that change, it has the responsibility. Now, where I really want to spend my time is on how must the scientific publishing industry do better. And to me, what I want to talk about requires a sea change. It's a paradigm shift as to how we view equity work that, in my opinion, is necessary for the scientific publishing industry to do better by the people it's harmed, the science it publishes, and the society it serves. The first step to me in, in, in doing better is to acknowledge the existence of harmful institutionalized processes right now. Acknowledge that racism, sexism, transphobia, transmisogyny, xenophobia, homophobia, et cetera, exist and thrive within our own institutions today. This is a non-starter. These processes are there. They might be hard to see as they're so deeply entrenched and insidious from the decades during which they were allowed unfettered and unchecked growth. But they didn't just disappear because DEI had a moment in 2020. They didn't disappear because organizations started having DEI initiatives. 
We are trying to right wrongs wrought over centuries. And we can't do that if we pretend like they're gone, simply because now we're saying we're doing something to counteract them. In fact, one could argue that these processes are fighting back and fighting back rather successfully given the growing number of anti-trans laws, of laws attacking bodily autonomy and DEI work. Denying that these processes exist, particularly when marginalized people in your institution tell you that they exist because they've experienced them, is a form of institutionalized gaslighting. Every day we, and by we, I mean the scientific publishing industry, academia, science, and STEM at large need to say, we have a racism problem, we have a sexism problem, we have a transphobia problem, and so on. What are we going to do today to fix those problems? The second thing that the scientific publishing industry must do is to center marginalized voices and perspectives. When this comes to primary research, for example, it's imperative that before we publish that research, we make sure that the research is held accountable to the people whom its findings impact. You can make sure that the research includes sex and gender minorities, trans or gender diverse researchers. If an article dealing with, with trans people comes in, get a trans peer reviewer. If you can't find one, look harder. If you still can't find one, download the March 14th issue of Cell, go through the roster of names there. If people there won't review it, I'm sure they'll have some leads. There is a mistaken belief that trans and gender diverse people can, cannot conduct or review, or in my case, edit work that is relevant to trans people because they're biased since it's too important to them. This is a concept that was introduced to me by a brilliant group of authors I worked with, um, the concept of epistemic injustice. We penalize trans people for how they know what they know, instead of embracing people who are forced to think about sex and gender every day and therefore have unique and invaluable lived experiences. And by the way, are often doing amazing work in sex and gender. Aside from primary research, commentary and perspectives and special issues are another critical way that the publishing industry can do better. First of all, we need to prioritize publishing equity pieces, center them in each and every issue of every journal, have special issues dedicated to them. These special issues are incredibly impactful. They have long lasting impact. There is no such thing as too much equity content. When we reach the point that our science is as diverse as it can get, as inclusive as it can get, as equitable and just as it can get, then we can scale back, but we're nowhere near that point. If we need more resources to be able to fully address equity in science and publishing in our journals pages, we need to find them or reallocate from somewhere else. We need to prioritize addressing persistent inequities. And when we have the honor to publish um, marginalized voices talking about their experiences in STEM, we shouldn't gatekeep the language they use to describe those experiences. I'm going to guess that there's many of you in the audience who come from marginalized communities and because of the diversity tax, you've done equity work and you might've prepared equity pieces and submitted them to scientific journals. And I'm further gonna guess that many of you have been told by a majoritized person likely in power that although they agree with what you're saying, your tone and your language are too strong and need to change. We know that this is just code for the way you talk about your struggles. Don't get me wrong, I'm supportive, but the way you talk about your struggles is making me feel uncomfortable and I can't be made to feel uncomfortable, particularly if you want me to be your ally. Let me tell you how to say what you wanna say. It is not up to us as publishers and editors to tell marginalized people what to say and how to talk about their experiences in STEM. If the publishing industry is going to be an ally to minoritized groups, we must confront our discomfort. We must place our comfort beneath that of the groups with whom we claim to be allies. Allies don't center their own comfort. It is not up to the minoritized to make the majoritized feel comfortable. If you're reading an equity piece and feeling comfortable, odds are it's not a good piece. Equity pieces need to disrupt the apathy that honestly, the majoritized are often privileged to experience. Effective equity pieces need to make people uncomfortable because we need to be uncomfortable with inequities. The moment we're not, progress stalls and the inequities further entrench. 
One thing that I've learned from doing equity work is, is that you're not making people feel uncomfortable and probably pissing off a lot of them along the way. You're not doing effective equity work. Now, we can also provide guidance as an industry. And these are our guidelines on reporting sex and gender-based analyses. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on these because Beans did a great job yesterday. I am just going to point out that um, one thing that was important about these guidelines is they delineated the concept of sex as in sex-related characteristics from sex as a categorization mechanism because the conflation of those two things have caused a lot of problems recently. Um, what's important about guidelines is they not just sit there, right? That editors need to use them and enforce them and point them out to authors and peer reviewers and critically, they must evolve over time. Now, the single most critical thing the publishing industry must, and all of academia must do, is it must elevate equity work to be of equal value as any other scientific work. Otherwise, as one former DEI colleague of mine told me, DEI positions and DEI initiatives are designed to fail. So equity work is scientific work. If we accept that our scientific output remains suboptimal because of an ongoing lack of full diversity, equity, inclusion, and justice, then doing the work to fix it is scientific work. Therefore, equity work needs to be considered of equal merit to hard science work and not a passion project that marginalized people can do on the side when they can fit it in. Equity work is hard work that takes time and resources. The people doing the equity work are most often the marginalized. We all know about the diversity tax, but treating the equity work that they do from which the institution benefits as a passion project is not only wrong, it's exploitative. In academia and publishing, the elevation of equity work needs to percolate through to hiring, promotion, performance reviews, and evaluations, tenure committees, et cetera. When hiring, particularly into positions of power, I wanna hear questions like, what kind of equity work have you done? What kind of equity work do you plan to do? If we gave you the job, what is something you would do that would make science more equitable in five years? How many of you in the audience have spent considerable time on equity work and wondered when it comes time to get a new job or go for a um, promotion or go for tenure, Will the time that you spent on the equity work be held of equal value to the time you could have spent on your primary research? I have lost count of how many DEI colleagues in both academia and publishing, including myself, have been told that they are or held professionally liable for doing too much DEI. There's no such thing as doing too much DEI. It's like telling a scientist, hey, you're doing too much science unless and until we fix the legacy notion that primary research work is science and therefore more important than equity work, which isn't science, we will be at best performing suboptimally and at worst spinning our wheels while, think while thinking we're going somewhere. We also need to change the concept of scientific impact. Highly cited primary research is considered the currency in academia and scientific publishing. We equate that with impact. But impact is far more than the number of citations. If you look at the Juneteenth issue in June of 2023 from Cell, there is a commentary in there from 52 Black scientists on racism in STEM. That is not the most highly cited article in Cell in 2023, but I challenge anyone to point to, to say that that article does not have impact and long lasting impact. Therefore, we need to take the word impact back. If we need to quantify it, we must find different ways to quantify it than through citations. Finally, we have to do equity work for the sake of doing equity work. I have spent a lot of time on sex and gender related initiatives, such as our guidelines on reporting sex and gender based analyses. In the course of that work, I have often used arguments about improving the accuracy, precision, and rigor of our science as a sort of Trojan horse to advance equity. Someone once told me that scientists don't care so much about being told they're not equitable or not as inclusive as they could be, but they don't like to be told they're inaccurate as a problem with their science. And to some extent, this has worked. However, I've really struggled with who is harmed when we sneak equity along like this, as opposed to um, spotlighting it. Who And who is harmed are the people that we're trying to help. In a way, they're being told, you can have your equity as long as you can justify it scientifically. In the days after the Conservative Political Action Committee opened its 2023 convention calling for the eradication of transgender people for the good of society, 
I wondered why it wasn't just enough to point to that, to get every journal at Cell Press to stop what it was doing and editorialize in unison in defense of our trans colleagues. I asked myself, why isn't equity for equity's sake enough? Why isn't doing the right thing because it's the right thing enough? Finally, the scientific publishing industry must ensure the right voices are in the room. When I worked on our Juneteenth commentary, I was acutely aware that I was that there was no uh, black editor itself. When I worked on a Latinas and STEM commentary that we published last November, I was acutely aware that there were no Latina editors at cell. And when I worked on the trans and STEM commentary, I was acutely aware that I was the only trans editor at cell. We need to diversify our editorial teams and importantly, the people who have power over them to make sure we have the right voices in the room. This is not just something for the publishing industry, but is obviously true for academia uh, at large. So a couple quick concluding remarks. I'm cognizant of the human dichotomy. On the one hand, faced with a global pandemic, we can develop, test, and introduce an effective vaccine. And on the other hand, we need velvet ropes to form and organize a zigzag line. Still, I struggle with the notion that if we, particularly the people with the power and the resources, really wanted to, we couldn't make science a truly diverse, inclusive, equitable, and just space. If the people with the power to effectuate that kind of change are not providing the resources and the support to do it, then I worry that on some level, on some level, we must conclude that they're okay with persistent inequities. Someone once told me that equity work never benefits the person doing it and that I need to view it as a tour of duty. When I asked her what she meant, she said, you go in, you do your equity work, you experience a boatload of trauma, you get out and you deal with that trauma for years. And another DEI colleague told me that during her tour of duty, she didn't sleep through a single night for fear not only of what was being done, but what wasn't being done. I've come to believe that if you're doing equity work, and not hurting personally, professionally, and likely both, you're not doing effective equity work. But these are the prices we exact from the people doing equity work in science is, and publishing is utter insanity. We need to change this, otherwise, as we know, the people doing equity work will leave publishing, leave scientific organizations, leave academia, and leave science at large. And how does that help science? How does that help our society? MLK said that change does not roll in on the wheels of inevitability, but comes through continuous struggle. If you're doing equity work, your struggle is to continue finding a way to do that work, continue challenging people, continue disrupting people's comfort and apathy. And if you're a majoritized person in a position of power, your struggle is to be an ally. And that means providing the resources and support to the people doing the DEI work that you and your institution benefit from while confronting and unpacking your own discomfort. Finally, I grew up being told that I must accept the things I cannot change. Scientific publishers, scientific organizations, academia, and science at large must never accept that there are inequities in science. And therefore, to paraphrase Dr. Angela Davis, these institutions must change the things that I cannot accept or that we cannot accept. They must do what it takes to rid science of persistent inequities. And I believe that as a society, we should conclude that anything less than that is quite frankly, unacceptable. Thank you for having me and thank you for listening to me. The best way to reach me is through LinkedIn or direct message on X. Thank you so much, um, Dr. Goldman, and, and to our other panelists as well. Um, so I'm going to get started with the Q&A. Um, there are uh, several questions in the chat that I, I will get to some of them, but I wanted to start um, with a question I had as I was listening to y'all speak. Um, it seems like there's um, a tension that I can see, and please you know, correct me if I'm wrong, between complicating the process of collecting data and of storing data to make sure that it's you know most accurate and then on the other hand communicating that broadly and maybe applying it to policy which could mean 
um, simplifying it or, or taking out some of the the complexity in some ways. Um, you know, I, I was thinking um, when Dr. McLean was talking about the um, sex karyotype variation, you know, if we tried to apply that to some policies, uh, it would not work. You know, like we don't need 23 bathrooms, for example. Um, and, and so I'm hoping to hear from y'all, um, you know, how far you think we should go in applying that complexity of, of science to our like everyday policies and to the way we communicate things. Um, and how does that depend on who is doing the, the messaging and for what purpose? I can answer that. Because uh, something, this is something that I, uh, I think about on a regular basis in the sense to where there are limitations to everything. There's only so much we can do because there's some stuff you could do it, but you shouldn't. Um, <laughs> one of the things that I take into consideration is not just the fact that biology has been used as a legitimating rationale for domination and exploitation, but also the fact that the reason why genetics and biology is brought up in conversations regarding hate issues with respect to patriarchy, which is a social problem, issues with regards to racism, a social problem, is because those systems of domination chose to use biology as the mask and the language for delivering, maintaining, and uh, maintaining and encouraging their own prop hegemonic propaganda. It's not because the answer to the way we should order, but like our policies and political order should purely be driven by the only the way biology works. That that's not why that's there. We're discussing this because people have no had no morals, and a good chunk of them, unfortunately, still a lot of people still ain't got none. But <laughs> and that is the the thing that is actually driving that relation. So, and, and, and that's one of the things I think is really important. Like why we have to understand why we are even talking about this in the first place. Like when I tell people they like, oh, race is not biology. And I go, okay, you're not done yet. Not only you have to define race and racism, you got to define biology. We have to define, we have to understand what these things are, understand their context with respect to, for example, the sex karyotypic variation, changing policies with respect to that, it would be more of, removing policies that try to enforce binary sex. We're not trying to enforce the variation. We're just trying to let it exist, leave it alone. Like that, so it's more of a, of a framework where we will be removing a lot of policies because they just don't need to be there and they don't need to be replaced. They just don't need to exist. Because like, the, like the, with the example you gave, like if we decide, oh, with respect to the bathroom bills, you, I know the United States government is not interested in creating 23 bathrooms. The same government that will not properly fund public education and is bombing and genociding Palestinians, I'm pretty sure they won't. They're not going to give y'all 24 bathrooms. It just ain't going down. <laughs> and they're not going to have all, they're not going to pay for all of us to get genetic testing. Most people don't get genetic testing. Except, especially specifically for sex karyotype. Like, it, and that's one of the things that I think is the funniest part about it with regards to the fact that what it's pointing to more than anything else is that they, it's about issues of power. The practices and the policies and standards that have to be transformed are those that are being utilized for ensuring and, and ensuring and maintaining the uh, like hegemonic relations and domination. The, it's only there for that purpose, given that fact, it can just be removed. You don't have to replace it with nothing. You can just leave people alone. Like, so using the, that, I think is a good part, a good chunk of a lot of the stuff that we're dealing with, unfortunately, when it comes to this framework, because as uh, Dr. Stevens pointed out in their presentation, there's some stuff you, like, you don't want, you don't want that in a data set. You don't need to put that in no computer. Y'all wilding. Like, don't do that. We don't need that. Some stuff we don't need that. And I think that's part of the applied ethics of it, of asking the question, like, what is really being done here? Why is that being asked? Why is it relevant? Because it's very similar to the policies that were also suggested with regards to, like, they, oh, let's put, we can put X in the cat for the options for gender. You could also not put gender at all. It's a whole option. You act like you can't identify somebody 
uh, on a license or ID if the if gender categories or the birth certificate if it's not, like you couldn't tell like let's not do this because it's really not because it's not about the matter of oh we need to know what your genitalia are because if they really had to say that. Like say that in front of everybody. What genitalia do you have in front of a group of people? <laughs> like, see, like the thinking about the way that we actually enforce these things, it doesn't make sense. Not only that, it, it doesn't make it, what it, the sense that it makes is dollars and change because that's the point is to exploit people to be able to generate a profit. So understanding that point, I think, is the most important part because then it can help us understand how do we move forward. Because some stuff we're not moving forward with, we just gonna leave it right where the fuck is at. I hope they answered your question. <laughs> Definitely. Um, Dr. Stevens or Goldman, did you have any, anything to add to that? I think I just want to underscore what Dr. McLean was saying, that we can remove policies and not add them back. One of the things, one of the reasons I talk about data modeling in my own work this time before the database gets created is because it's this moment where we can have an imagination and where we can really think about worlds that we we want to live in, right? And so I can think about, do I even need gender in this context? Do I even need sex in this context? Or do I need a ton more information than we normally collect, right? I can't tell you in your context what's appropriate. Statistically, we need less and not more, but maybe you need a ton more. And so rather than being fixated on policies and regulations, and I saw some notes in there about data interoperability, which are technically very important, but happen way down the line, happen often at the API level and not the data modeling level. So one of the reasons data modeling is so, so important is because like Dr. McLean was saying, we can imagine worlds where we just don't use this information, where we use other criteria, where we think about these things differently. And um, data modeling, database design is a really material way we can practice making those worlds real um, and experiment with making those worlds real. And so I just wanted to add that to his really smart comments. Great. Um, Dr. Goldman, there's a question specifically for you in the chat that I, I wanted to read um, from Andrea Cantor. Uh, your comment that we as marginalized people are expected to do DEI work in our spare time and that it should be valued more literally made me break down and cry. I'm so tired, but there's nothing that could keep me from this work. How do you recommend we advocate for ourselves to be given time and money for doing DEI work rather than trying to fit it in around the things we have to do to support ourselves? That's a complicated question, and I'm not sure that I'm a success story for that, but I think that um, the first thing is to take care of yourself because if you burn out and leave, that's one less person doing equity work, right? And the more effective, the more people who are doing effective equity work leave, the more mediocre equity work starts to seem like effective equity work. And I think taking care of yourself means kind of building a coalition like within your institution and um, outside of your institution, you know, finding out who your allies are so that you're not fighting the people in power alone um, and keep at it, keep demanding the resources, keep pushing, um, but but take care of yourself. And in the end, if you find yourself in a, an abusive situation, get out, right? Because it's it's there's nothing more important than taking care of yourself. Get out and go somewhere else and continue your advocacy there. Thanks for responding to that. Um, Dr. Stevens, I know you answered this uh, question in the chat, but I wanted to bring it um, to the, the verbal part of the conversation. Um, so how do you deal with not needing gender and or sex info um, when others and institutions are trying to put you to include it? Um, which I think just more broadly too is um, a question that I had for y'all. You know, you, you're thinking about this again in a way that is more complicated and that at times could require you know more time more energy for people to even shift the way that they're thinking about this um how do you make that case um I, i'd be curious to hear like if, if y'all have made that case in your own lives um that you can share with people um and then advice that you have for others who are trying to do the same yeah, I would love to hear from um, the like the clinicians or the scientists on this, but the ways that one of the ways that I've pushed back is with curiosity, right? Why do you need this? Often it's because they want to sort, 
right? We want to sort people into male and female, into bathrooms, into roommates, into any number of situations that they use gender as a proxy for, um, or they need it for funding. They need to prove that they're diverse enough or, right, that they have done, they've met certain criteria. Um, and so I start there, right? Because, and, and just because they need that doesn't mean I need that. Right. Are there ways that if you're pushing me to do that, I can support you meeting your requirements and not compromise my own. Right. Because a lot of what this is also is data interoperability and playing nice. And in the future that I want to build, we're still relational. And so we're still negotiating with each other. And so there are sometimes we'll make compromises, but ultimately it's not about me saying, no, my way is the only way. And you have to you have to meet my demands to work with me because that's what they've been doing to us. It's about being relational with each other, staying curious and asking, are there other pieces of information we can use to meet the requirements that you have? But again, I would love to hear from the clinicians because that's not me. Uh, something that I'm also thinking about uh, with respect to that is not even just asking just like, why do you need it? And what do you need? But also like, what is it that you really need? Because also with the why, because we know what, there are requirements where you can't get government funding without collecting specific data. There are incentives that have been provided by the state, the settler state. So there's that as a driver in and of itself. Not to mention the fact there's also the other issue with respect to us not really having in a, a, a full understanding of the basic meanings of the math. We want it to represent something else would the math be able to, to make the information appear to be something that it's not? It's about objectifying something, like utilizing measures and proxies to then make it look like another relationship is occurring to conflate things. Because we, we can't act like people don't also play games with data and with what they collect and how they collect it and why. And I think a lot of it also it connects to understanding the context for how we're actually collecting the information in the first place. Because a lot of these things are not necessarily, you're not really like, a lot of times people don't know, they're not asking about sex in the first place. They're asking about gender and they can't tell the difference between the two. And that causes a, a, a series of problems. Not to mention the fact that in some cases, you're not really asking about sex, you're asking about specific types of categorizations and representations. And in some cases, what it is is you're breaking down particular pieces of information, but conflating them into being something else is unnecessary. So understanding the power relations that also come with those categories and the people who actually have to live with that, how are they treated on a consistent basis? Because they will be put in, they likely be put in a position of being vulnerable given the potentially exposure or regards to the data set, not to mention uh, being surveilled. So taking these things into consideration is important um, on, on that level. But I think also in a number of different ways, we kind of got to sit with a lot of what uh, what academia and, and, and science as an industry overall tries to drive people to do with math that they shouldn't. We're trying to put push things into models and stuff like because that's one of the things I take into consideration because it's also done with respect to race. And a lot of the times, for instance, people are correcting the, the proxies they're using are not that's not right. Like you're you racialized your respondent or they provided their racial identity, but their racial identity, their person, what they think is their racial identity is a culmination of human interactions how they racialize themselves after being taught how to being socialized into these logics and the culminating from responses of how other people have racialized them and they process that info. So that means that we're incorrectly collecting information in the first place. So we have to understand the directions of the relationships that exist between human beings as well. That's central to what we're doing with respect to measuring this. Because gender, for example, that's about auto that's autonomy. You don't get to tell me who I am. I tell you. That's how it works. My gender is mine. You don't get to determine I am the only person who gets to determine who I am. No one else. It's as simple as that. The notion that gender is determined purely by biological sex and correspondence with genitalia or sex karyotype is less than two, is look, about what? Less, is less than 210 years old, like two, about two centuries. 
it doesn't like so that's one of the things we don't have to hold on to certain stuff because it don't belong to us that's not mine that's the settlers i don't need that so i i think one of the things that's important for us to understand is the the power relationships that can really help us highlight like what's actually going on what are we really trying to measure what do you act what is your driving question your 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 hypothesis and why is this variable relevant i think those kinds of the standards, having those kinds of standards along with contextual oper operationalizing is really important because unfortunately, most people in, in academia, it's too many people in academia and sci in public, like published scientific work I see, they don't operationalize. They don't define anything. They just take the, it just is. It's so like, it should be easy to understand. And this is unquestionable. Oh, I, like, don't we know this is a fact? Who's we? Define fact. Like, so I think a lot of it also has to do with how scientific knowledge is produced. So there's a lot that has to be done to change that about how we ask those questions and why we're asking them. Okay. Um, Dr. Goldman, I want to give you a, a chance to to briefly respond if you if you want to do that um, before we unfortunately have to end. Um, yeah, I just wanted to highlight a comment that was made in the chat that I think is important. It's about transparency. Like, you encounter questions that are poorly worded, worded, right? And you just walk away and it, they're just infuriating. And it feels like if there was more transparency to say like, you know, we recognize that this is not the best way to ask these questions, but we're mandated to by X, Y, Z. I think that would help a lot to understand that the questions are not coming from a place of ignorance, but a com coming from a place of, um, you know, b uh, having to operate under certain kinds of laws. And the other thing I would say is like, I, I don't, you know, uh, like, just because we did something a certain way in data before doesn't mean that we have to do it like that going forward, right? It's like the, the, the sex assigned at birth question, like, I often tell people like, you don't actually have to ask that question if it's not relevant, right? I feel like on every form, it's, it's there somewhere. And it, it feels like it's all designed to get trans people to just give an answer that they just don't want to give, you know, and it's not, it's not relevant. It doesn't give um, the kind of information that you're looking for, or worse, it gives spurious information, right? We, we yesterday would talk about organ inventories, which gives the kind of answers that you need. Um, and so it's just, you know, it's never, it should never be a reason like, well, this is the way we've done it. That should never be a reason for anything, right? Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you to all of our panelists today. Please send them applause emojis um, in the comments. Um, and now I want to pass it along to NHGRI Communications Director, Sarah Bates, who is going to offer closing remarks. Thank you so much, Aaliyah. Um, yeah, I can't believe we're already at closing remarks. The last two days have gone by so quickly. I want to say on behalf of NIH and the National Human Genome Research Institute, I want to thank all of our amazing presenters and moderators for these last two days. You've demonstrated that you are strong communicators of science in addition to being incredible scholars and researchers. I am honored to close out this fantastic event. It's been absolutely amazing. It's exceeded all of our expectations and has set a new standard for what cooperative, compassionate science can look like. We've heard further evidence today that sex and gender or gender sex as the indomitable and Foster Sterling puts it is beautifully complex. And that careful, precise, multidisciplinary study are required to rise to the occasion. A multidisciplinary perspective looks a lot like the variety of expertise you've heard about in the symposium. History, philosophy, ethics, social science, legal studies, all of these forms of exp expertise consider important aspects of humanity. And representation from these fields is necessary in partnership with the biological sciences for us to understand gender and sex in people. As Dr. Baker noted this morning, there is no single template for the full diversity of humanity. Further, we've learned that sex and sexuality can change across a human lifespan. As we age, as we learn about ourselves, and as we interact with our environments. And these changes are rich for scientific inquiry. Because, again, as Dr. Baker said, sex, sex, 
sexual orientation, and gender are things that everyone has. These are elements of personhood. It is only for some that the foundational elements of personhood are problematized and politicized. And there is no inherent reason why that should be so. We heard that's because power, not nature, dictates the current classification of sex, gender, and sexual orientation, as Dr. Grzynka showed us in his talk. Dr. McLean provided more insight of how this came to be by revealing the colonial history of biology and sex, providing historical evidence going back to the 1400s of how power has shaped and harmed our understanding of the human body. Because science is done by humans, so no science is ever neutral. Science is always the product of the thinking, tools, and cultures of its time. How, as Dr. Stevens asked today, do we at scientific institutions ensure that we acknowledge our responsibility in learning about and from the lives, learning about and acknowledging the lives that are worth receiving infrastructure? Good science is ethical science, to paraphrase Dr. Goldman. To achieve equity in science, we must listen to those most affected by existing inequities. That's part of why we invited this outstanding group of researchers to join us for these two days, to meaningfully discuss and share their thinking with all of you. As scientists and members of society, it is our responsibility to not only do good science, but to communicate good science, as Drs. Green and Dietz noted in their opening yesterday, to encourage curiosity and resource interdisciplinary collaboration the recording of this event will be posted on genome.gov, on our website, and on YouTube in about a week, as quickly as we can edit it. We will email all registered participants the recording once it is up. And I should say by editing, that just means we're going to take out the pauses. No content will be edited. I especially want to thank my NIH colleagues, NHGRI Director Eric Green, SGMRO's Karen Parker, and ORWH's Elizabeth Barr as well as symposium organizers, Liz Dietz, Brittany Kish, and Christopher Donahue for making this event happen. Let's keep this conversation going in our communities and the spaces we're in. Stay safe and thank you.